Hello. This is the BBC's Tomorrow's World Live, a new and interactive science show. I'm Dr. Hannah Critchlow. I'm a neuroscientist, and I am obsessed with all things brainy. We're going to be hearing more from this one very shortly. So tonight, we're partnering up with some of the leading UK research institutes in order to scan the horizon to try to predict what is in store for humanity in the future. And where better to base ourselves than some of the UK's best science museums? So later in this series, we're lucky enough to be visiting the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. But tonight, we are here in the London Science Museum with this wonderful audience, this wonderful live audience. Big cheer. Hello. Hello. And a big warm hello to all of those that are watching elsewhere on your screens. Now, you guys are going to be a big part of tonight. So participate, get involved. Please do let us know your comments, give us your ideas, and ask your questions. You can send all these in via Twitter using the hashtag MyTomorrow, and you can also post your comments on Facebook Live or YouTube. OK, so what is it that we're going to be exploring tonight? Well, we're going to be, <laughs> this one here is quite a big clue. Um, we're going to be looking at a move to Mars. We're incredibly fortunate. We're going to be joined by some of the UK's leading space scientists. We've got a panel of experts, and we're going to be probing whether humanity could ever start to colonize that little red planet that's over 54 million kilometers away. So, um, yeah, we're going to be starting very shortly with our panel of experts. But before we meet those, I want us to say a warm hello to this one here, who uh, likes dressing in astronauts' clothing. This is Dr. Jen Gupta. She is an astroscientist and also a self-proclaimed science nerd. Hello, Jen. Oh, hi. Um, a little bit warm in there. A little bit warm. Um, so, Jen, first impressions, they're quite important, aren't they? I'd say they're pretty important. I mean, I've certainly come dressed to make a first impression. You're rocking it. You're rocking oh. it. Uh, <laughs> now, just imagine, right? So if you're the first person ever to land on a foreign land and a new planet that never before has seen a human touch, right? Yeah, if I you're going to land there for the first time. Yeah, I've been planning to be an astronaut since I was like 14. So yeah, I'm on it. Yep. OK, so say you're part of the first crew to Mars. Yep. You open up the hatch, yep. start to tread down the rungs of the ladder. First footprint, a gen-sized footprint Ooh. on Mars. Yep. What are you going to say? The whole world oh. is watching. Bated breath here. Oh, that's too much. You can't just land that on me. And you also... Need a moment to think about that. You need the moment, moment to yeah. think about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's a moment. OK. I mean, you've got to be careful because you don't want to accidentally say the wrong thing or be misquoted, misheard. Um, think of you, Neil Armstrong. Uh, and, Ooh. you know, especially in these days of social media, uh, you'll be on Twitter forever. There'll be memes in the internet forever of your first words on Mars. So you've got to be pretty careful. OK, and to add to the pressure, right, you yep. are speaking not just for yourself, but on behalf of the generation millennials, the generation avocado on smashed toast, the generation selfie, <laughs> the generation <laughs> Mars, if you like. Okay. So what are you going to say, Jen? Go right. on. I've got it. <laughs> That's another small step for a human, mm -hmm. a 142 times further leap for humankind. Do you get it? Because Mars is 142 times further away from the Earth than the Moon. That's I, did, I did the maths. That's, that's fantastic. Well, no, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah. Emma, you're really nice. <laughs> okay, but I mean, I think you are too could, nice. I think we could do something that's a little bit more catchy, maybe. Okay. Um, one step closer to infinity and beyond. Ah, uh -huh, I like yeah. it. I like it. There's a Toy Story reference there. Yeah. Okay. And uh, anything else? I mean. Maybe Toy Story is a little bit too, too dated. We want something that really speaks for our generation, speaks yeah. for our time. So I've been thinking about what, what's the first question you might ask when you go somewhere new? OK, uh, how about, is there Wi-Fi? <laughs> no? 
I think that we could do some downhill. help here. Yeah. What is the first thing that you would say if you landed on Mars? Yeah, I think all of my suggestions there were pretty lame, but I'm sure all of you watching can do better by the end of the show. So if you have any suggestions for your first words on Mars, please do send them in. You can send them in on Twitter using the hashtag MyTomorrow, or you can leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube. But how likely is it that any of us are really going to set foot on Mars? For decades now, experts have been predicting that a trip to Mars is just around the corner. This from the BBC archive. Meanwhile, the Soviets have nearly all the technology they need to take cosmonauts to Mars. Barring setbacks, it looks as though the Soviets could be on their way to Mars by the mid-1990s. The obvious first step would be to set up a manned base on the moon. But with the Soviets heading straight for Mars, the Americans might just bypass the moon and join in that race to the red planet. So the question is not whether a man will land on Mars, but whether it'll be before the year 2000 and whose flag will be flying. So that was first broadcast with Tomorrow's World in 1987. Two years later, and the Berlin Wall fell. It was the collapse of the Cold War, the end of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, and it was also the end of the space race between the two original superpowers. And we're now nearly two decades from the year 2000 mentioned at the end of that clip. So I guess our first question tonight, Hannah, is when? Will a human on Mars always feel like it's 30 years away, or could it actually happen in our lifetimes? More importantly, can I go to Mars? What would it take for me, personally, to live and work on the Red Planet? Well, we're about to be joined by some guests who can help to answer my questions, and hopefully any questions all of you have out there as well. Our first guest is a woman after my own heart. When she was 17, she wrote to NASA to ask for work experience, and they said yes. Since then, she's worked for the European Space Agency, training astronauts and flight commanders uh, for um, space flight, and she now manages the Human Space Flight Program for the UK Space Agency. Please welcome Libby Jackson. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hey. And we're also lucky enough to be joined by Professor Monica Grady from the Open University. Now, she has dedicated her working life to trying to investigate whether there is any alien life out there. Welcome, Monica. I, uh, I oh, so, Libby, I guess we have to start with the obvious question. Why should we go to Mars? I mean, you know, my answer would be, I guess, because it's there, a bit like Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And as someone who studies space from the ground, it's incredibly exciting to think that one day we might go to one of those objects that we study. But what's the scientific reason for going? The biggest scientific reason, and there are lots, is, is there life on Mars? That's the question we want to understand. Answering that question will help us understand so much about ourselves, where we came from, how the planet has evolved, and it will alter our understanding. If we are not the only people in this solar system or in this universe, or I should say, if we're not the only life forms that have ever existed, what does that mean for the rest of the universe? So we want to go and find out. But why do we need to send humans there? Can't we just send you know, robots or satellites, for example, to go and probe and, uh, and answer that very question? And indeed, that's one of those questions. Do you want to say something? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should yes. Know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we send robots. Of course we send robots. We send robots first. And then we send people because, you know, you said, it's there. We are explorers. We, we want to push yeah. the boundaries. You know, we crossed the Atlantic. We crossed the Pacific. We went to the moon. The next obvious step, step is to go to, the, to Mars. And I've got a great question here already from someone in the audience. Uh, someone who's uh, watching on Facebook Live. Hello there, it's Monica from Budapest. Uh, and she's saying, if we send people to Mars, are we actually going to be able to bring them back or is it just going to be a one-way trip? We would want to bring them back. We would want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we would, the space agencies would absolutely want to bring the humans back. Some people would like to say, given the option, because there are some people who would like to go and colonize it. But any of the early trips 
would be a, a trip there and a trip back. But there is another question is, should we even send humans? If we're going out there to try and find life, and we think that life might exist on Mars, when we send rovers and, and robots to the planet, we have to sterilize them to make sure that we send nothing from Earth there. If we send humans there, it's going to be really difficult to keep Mars isolated from, from human life. So should we even send them? And so, but, so kind, of, kind of following on from there, Monica, is there life on Mars? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. But if there isn't, that is more important than if there is. Because when the Earth formed, it was really, really hot. It was molten. Same with Mars, but Mars cooled more quickly. And before life got going on Earth, Mars was habitable. It had uh, water, it had clouds, it had an atmosphere, it had all the ingredients and for life. And in fact, um, what we're showing here on the screen is an artist's impression of Mars back then, sort of four billion years ago. And so on this artist's impression, I guess all the yeah. blue stuff there is that water that we yeah. contain a lot. So, so there was water, there was all the organics, everything that was there. If life didn't get going, why didn't it get going? And that is also a really important question because if it didn't get going on, on Mars, there are very few other places in the solar system where it could have got going. So that makes us even more aware of how precious our planet is. And we've got a, another question coming in on Twitter. Ed Parsons uh, says, not sure about Mars, but as a child, I was promised a moon base. Get on with it. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's this argument to say, why are we going to Mars rather than maybe going back to the moon? Oh, we are. Oh, we are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> the, the architecture that the plans to get to Mars will probably involve going to the moon as a test bed. Going to Mars is hugely difficult. We've, as you said, we've always been about 30 years away. I really think we are now about 20 to 30 years away. But we still have to tackle challenges like radiation, landing propulsion, these sorts of things. And we can try out a lot of those by going to the moon first. If we settle, we might get stuck there. So we'd like to get there, try some things out, and then push on to Mars. And it's the sort of thing that um, the space agencies, not just the UK space agency, but the European space agency, the Russians, NASA, the Chinese, they're all pushing for the moon. There are lots of lunar missions planned from 2020 onwards. From 2020 and, onwards. Uh, well, that's only in a you know, couple mm -hmm. of years' time. Mm -hmm. And nice the European Space Agency director, he wants to have a moon base. So it, it will be a stepping off point because the most difficult part of, of explore, exploring space is getting off the Earth. If you can get off the Earth and you can get to the moon and you can use the moon as a refueling station, then, you know, the planetary system is your oyster. <laughs> the planetary system is your oyster. And I don't know whether Jen has just gone off to examine the planetary system out there. I'm here. Uh, she's I'm there. Here. Okay. I just want to say quickly, thank you so much to everybody who's got in touch with your questions and comments so far. Uh, if you've got any more questions and comments for uh, experts, Monica here and also Libby, and also our experts that are going to be joining us later in the show, then please do keep your comments and ideas coming in. You can tweet them with the hashtag MyTomorrow and you can also um, post them on Facebook Live and YouTube. Over to you, Jen. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, now, one obvious thing we have to figure out is what sort of spacecraft we're going to use to send humans to Mars. At the moment, we send astronauts to and from the International Space Station in one of these, a Soyuz capsule. And I'm trying not to freak out right now because not only has this object behind me gone into space, it's the one that brought astronaut Tim Peake back to Earth last year. So while I try to keep it together, I'd like to introduce Doug Millard um, to tell us all about it. Welcome, Doug. Hello. Could you tell us what you do here at the museum? Uh, I'm the space curator. I mean, that sounds like a fantastic job um, in one sentence. Uh, so this is the actual spacecraft that Tim Peake used to come back to Earth last year. People might be surprised that a capsule as retro looking as this, designed in the 1950s, is still in use today. Absolutely, yes. They started thinking about it at the end of the 50s, started flying it in the 60s. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It still <laughs> does the job. It's more sophisticated than it appears. Now, you've told me that I'm not actually allowed to go inside the Soyuz capsule, otherwise I'll be escorted from the museum by security, which, if I'm being honest, sounds like a fair enough price to pay. But could you explain a little bit about what it's like for the astronauts inside? It's really cramped. Uh, if you look inside the hatch, you'll see that 
uh, you know, it, there's three couches. Actually, it's even more cramped when they're ready to fly because some items have been taken out. It's three sardines in a row, really <laughs> cramped up. And it looks pretty kind of burnt and bashed up here now. What's it like? Has that happened in re-entry when they come back to Earth? Yes, I mean, it slams into the atmosphere at many thousands of kilometres per hour and it gets hot. That's how it slows down. Uh, about 1,500 degrees Celsius, that's why it's all burnt. Then it gets surrounded with a plasma, 5,000 degrees Celsius. Oof. So that's seriously hot. So I guess the astronauts during that time are quite focused inside, but if they looked out the window, they'd basically see fire. Yes, they would. <laughs> and they'd see bits of the heat shield flying Ooh. past. And right. then this beautiful mauve and then white plasma glow. It's very special. OK, you were almost putting me off there for a second, but the, the beauty of it seems to be bringing me back. Uh, we've been talking at the moment about sending people to space at the moment in the present day, but is this the kind of thing that we would use to send humans to Mars? I suspect when we get to Mars, we'll be using uh, advanced versions of this type of spacecraft, the Americans as well. Uh, we've shown that they can work, so I think advanced, more sophisticated versions of this are quite likely to go to Mars. All right, well, I'd better get back before the temptation overcomes me and I hop the barrier and get inside. Doug, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome back to Jen there. She's making her way shortly. She lo actually looks like she might collapse from a bit of a fainting. Oh, my days, that system. was so cool. <laughs> oh, it's been in space. It's been in space. Very exciting. Ah, I want to go inside. Just a reminder that you're watching Tomorrow's World live. Uh, a new and interactive science show. I'm Hannah Critchlow. And I'm Jen Gupta. Uh, tonight is a big celebration of science and technology organised by the BBC and also in partnership with the Royal Institution, the Royal Society, the Welcome and... The Open University. The Open University, you. Thank can you can check out the BBC's <laughs> Tomorrow's World website for more. And just a reminder that if you do have any questions about Mars for us and our experts, please do keep them coming in on Facebook Live and YouTube and we'll get through as many of them as we can. You can also tweet us using the hashtag MyTomorrow. Later, we'll be streaming some fascinating space experiments with our reporter, Dr. Ellie Cosgrave, who we've been sending out to the other parts of the museum tonight. And Dr. Hannah Fry will also be answering questions about superbugs on Mars. So get your questions ready for her afterwards. Now then, Jen, there's maybe lots of good reasons for us to go to Mars. Do you think that's something that you would consider, though? I mean, it's going to take like six or seven months to get there, right? Yeah, you know what's putting me off is I checked the um, ESA website and I'm half a centimetre too short um, within the ESA <laughs> guidelines. <laughs> so, Olivia, I don't think I could be one of your astronauts. Put some heels on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just stretch myself. I mean, I think I'm up I've been planning for this since I was like 14. Um, I think my main concern with a mission to Mars, though, is that it's like six or seven months. You're in a tin can, basically, with a bunch of other people, and I'm kind of a little bit more worried that my fellow astronauts might start winding me up a little bit. You know, I don't know, by maybe, I don't know, talking about neuroscience 24-7? How very rude. <laughs> yeah, How very rude. Nothing against you. Well, Florian in the Science Museum audience has got another concern. He says, uh, what does the air smell like on Mars? Is it a bit stinky? No, probably not, actually. It's mainly carbon dioxide uh, and nitrogen and argon. I mean, the, the amount of uh, sulfur species, which is what makes, it, um, makes things stink, are very, very low quantities. But um, one of my colleagues somewhere else in the Science Museum has got some postcards, which is the smell of a comet on it, which has got lots and lots of sulfur in it, and it absolutely stinks. And we're desperate to get rid of these postcards because they stink <laughs> our office out. So, so we don't think Mars would stink. Sulfur's basically gone off egg, isn't it? It's really, really, yeah, really yeah, disgusting yeah, smell. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Well, we're delighted to be able to welcome our next guest. Yeah, to the I'm panel uh, pretty excited by this because we're going to be joined by two space doctors. And by that, I mean medical doctors who know about space flight and the human body, not PhD doctors who just know about stuff in space like me. So first up, one of the UK's leading experts in space medicine. He's one of the co-founders of the Centre for Altitude, Space and Extreme Environment Medicine at University College London. Whew. And he's also right. a fellow at The Welcome. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Fong. Hello, Kevin. 
And our final guest tonight has personal experience of what might be involved when living in Mars. She's recently come back from an isolated research station in Antarctica, nicknamed White Mars. Please welcome Dr. Beth Healy. Kevin, I think we've got a question for you here from uh, somebody in the audience. And he's wondering, uh, what are conditions like on Mars? Would you need some shielding to give you some protection from the radiation? You would definitely need some shielding from radiation because Mars doesn't have the same blank of atmosphere that protects the Earth, and it doesn't have a magnetic field that scoops these particles out of the way. But, but it is further away from the sun, so you get some protection from that. And you can bury yourself under the surface of Mars. So, Yes, you need shielding, but that shielding actually you can get from Mars being radioactive. The dangerous bit of going to Mars in terms of radiation is the bit from Earth to Mars, because then you're in deep space, no, almost no shielding, and you're very vulnerable. And that actually ties into this weird looking vest that's next to me. People might be wondering what the heck this is. Um, this is actually a vest that's been made with future Mars travelers in mind. It's been um, adapted from a suit designed to protect first responders in high radiation conditions like the Fukushima disaster. So Kevin, is that why astronauts would have to wear something like this on their journey? Yeah, I mean, their, their radiation environment is in space is very, very challenging because you've got the background radiation that's just there by virtue of the sun shining and then radiation coming from outside of our solar system. And then you've got the threat of these big explosive events on the sun, so solar particle events, solar flares, which dump a whole bunch of high energy particles uh, into our near space environment. And those will kill you pretty promptly. So yes, you'll need to be shielded, but we've still got a few things to work out. Turning to you, Beth, um, you've recently returned from living in one of the most remote places on Earth, in Antarctica, um, and part of that was simulating what an extended mission in an extreme isolated environment might be like. So could you tell us a little bit about what you did there and what you learnt that might inform a mission to Mars? Sure. Uh, so I was at Concordia Station, um, and the reason we're using it as a research platform um, is because the crew there is completely isolated for nine months because of the cold temperatures um, and because we have 105 days where we don't see the sun at all. Whoa. So this is uh, some it. wonderful photographs. Yep, that's photograph. me actually at lunchtime. So it really what? is completely dark all the time. Wow. Um, and these factors together, because it is so isolated, um, it's a really interesting place for us to do research, to look at the sort of psychological and physiological challenges, as well as the medical models that future astronauts might need on long duration missions, where we're not going to be able to sort of evacuate people as quickly as we can now from space. I'm quite interested to know whether it all descends into something like a uh, reality television show. You know, everybody <laughs> goes slightly uh, skewed, and um, yeah, some interesting that, that, things. That didn't happen. happen in my reality show. <laughs> <laughs> Do you all pair off in the research facility? Or? Yes, it's, it's funny. So before we go, we have sort of this training, so human behaviour performance training at the astronaut centre, and they tell us about some of the challenges that we might face as a crew, sort of based on previous experiences. And you kind of laugh it off as you sort of meet these people that all seem, you know, very normal and nice. Um, but of course, in that environment, you do sort of experience some unusual behavior um, and some interesting changes in crew dynamics. Um, so, and I guess that's part of the fun of it as well. Interesting changes in crew dynamics. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, code, that's code for what? <laughs> that's code for everyone when it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, we, we're obviously looking at your pictures from Antarctica here right now, and we can see the, the blue sky. So, related mm. to that, Daisy Doyle on Twitter wants to know on Mars, is the sky blue? Mm -hmm. No. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> the sky on Mars. No, Mars no. is very dim, actually. So, so because it's you know in a straight line distance, it's sort of tens of millions of miles further away. So the sun is dimmer, you know, and uh, uh, and w what the colour of the sky is like on Mars precisely, I don't know. The, 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 the atmosphere is quite thin, so there's yeah. not that much of the same amount of opportunity for scattering which is what creates the blue colour of our sky. But the, the scattering will be different because um, it's mainly nitrogen and carbon dioxide rather than nitrogen and oxygen. It's mainly carbon dioxide. Um, so, so, so basically so nobody except for Arnold Schwarzenegger knows. No, yeah, there, no there are pictures, there are pictures uh, from some of the rovers and they're shown as a pale mauve. Okay. Ooh, that pale sounds mauve. quite nice. See, this is just making me want to go to Mars sounds more and more. But 
We have a question from Johnny on Twitter that might change my mind. Considering the mess we humans have made slash are making of this planet, do we have the right to inevitably do the same to another? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, we've put, got a space treaty that defines okay. that. So um, way back in the 60s, when we were looking at going into space for the first time, um, the UN came together and we laid down a treaty that countries have ratified, the UK, the US, Russia have signed up to. Mm -hmm. And it says that we will not make a mess of Mars. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Um, so all of this talk of a mission to Mars is very well, but while I might make it, and I am going to make it, and you've reassured me that it's okay for me to make it, it is unlikely that we're all going to be able to go. I think holidays to Mars are a way off. Are you okay with that, Hannah? Are you okay with staying here on Earth while I go off adventuring out into the solar system? What, not being exposed to so much radiation? <laughs> being able to move my body freely without having to wear that vest? <laughs> Uh, and listen to bird song, have a nice non-mauve sky. I think, you know what, I think I will be okay. But what I am concerned about is how much this little jolly of yours is going to cost the rest of us that stay here on Earth. It's so not a jolly, it's, it's not a scientific, scientific endeavour. Endeavor. Okay, so, so some people have suggested that it's going to uh, cost billions and billions of pounds yep. for oh, this yep. mission to Mars, this exploration. Uh, I, I hate to sound really selfish here, but what benefit am I going to get from this? Okay, I see where you're going. Right, I can hopefully persuade you on this. Mm -hmm. I've got a little quiz to help answer that. Just give me a second. I've got a bag behind here with some items in it. And now I don't want any cheating from the panel. You're not allowed to help Hannah because you'll probably know the answer to this. But I want you to tell me what relates these three items, okay? Mm -hmm. I've got for you some enriched baby food. Actually very tasty. I uh, don't want to know why you know that. Um, a memory foam pillow. Right. Very comfortable. And last but not least, I have for you a ski boot. So, what links those three items? One of the best holidays of my life. <laughs> Your best holiday <laughs> involves yes, baby food. Don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. Um, I mean, I guess that's an okay answer, but no. Um, these are all items that have been claimed as spin-offs from space technology that's been developed by different space agencies to help us go out and explore. I could have also mentioned a sun-powered fridge and um, noise control for a chicken factory, but I couldn't work out how to bring that along tonight. Or why on earth space exploration came up with the development of, sorry, what? Noise control for, for chicken? Licking, no, okay, right. Uh, <laughs> It, do you think there's going to be anything from this mission to Mars, this move to Mars, that uh, might be relevant for us here on Earth? Yeah, and, and you can't predict it. I mean, one of, the, one of the amazing things about going into space is everything has got to be uh, small, it's got to be, uh, require a low power, um, and it's got, it's got to be portable. And once you've developed something for space purposes, you can then use it for other things useful on Earth. And I've been agitating for ages, not, you know, publicly, but it's public, <laughs> to have Isn't something, that? you know, on your baby food, on your ski boot, which says, made using space technology. Ah. So that once you realize actually how fundamental those things are that comes from space technology, and you, and you realize, and you might say, oh, well, why do you have to go to, to Mars or to a comet to actually develop that? Well, you've got to have a, a, an impulse and a, an incentive to do it. You don't come in and sit down and think, oh, today I'm going to develop a new baby food using such and such and such and such. But you have to develop a space food and you think, oh, we can apply that to babies. Ivan, have you got any? So, I, look, I mean, I think it's wonderful. A lot of technology is catalyzed by a space program. But I don't think, and I can't stop saying it, spin-offs are not a way to justify a space program. That's not why you go into space. You go into space with humans and robotic platforms to explore. And it is exploration. Exploration is what we do. And from that comes fundamental knowledge, which allows us to survive further. If we were having this conversation uh, 100 years ago, in 1917, we'd, we'd be saying, why go to Antarctica? You know, what's the point of putting human-rated bases down there? And yet, before the end of that same century, 
They're pulling ice cores out of that continent, and the paleo atmospheres are telling us without a shadow of a doubt that the world is warming, and we've got to do something about it. And so what starts out as an exploration and an expedition becomes fundamental knowledge that literally has the potential to save the planet, and there's no reason why that shouldn't be the same with the Moon, Mars, or the rest of space. And on a related question, so somebody from the audience, Owen from Belfast, has get, got in touch saying, how are we actually going to generate power on Mars? We can do it a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, there is solar power out there. The rovers that drive themselves around at, at the moment, they are solar powered. You've got an issue with dust that will collect on the solar panels. Uh, you may also end up using some kind of radioisotope. You've got the issues of, of taking nuclear power there, but it could be done. And Madeline Tudorif has got in touch via YouTube asking, could we use the same technology for terraforming Mars and use that, that technology to better protect our own planet? Would we want to terraform Mars? This comes back to the question that was asked earlier about do we have the, the right to go to Mars? So could we, could we take a step? What, so what would be the difference between terraforming and establishing a base on Mars? Well, terraforming is changing the planet to make it look like Earth. Okay. So that would be doing things like trying to, uh, well, melt a lot of the subsurface ice to try and generate more of an atmosphere, which would then stabilize uh, uh, water on the surface. Okay. And, and then you'd have lakes and rivers. But you have to say, well, hang on a minute, Mars lost its atmosphere. So what makes you think that it would keep an atmosphere again? And quite frankly, I don't think we have the technology or the right the ethical right to do anything like that. Would we be able to, in accordance with the 1960s legislation <laughs> that was passed previously, would we be able to terraform Mars or even meteorites, for example? I, I, I am not a space lawyer, so I'm not <laughs> going to try and answer that question. We but, have space lawyers. But yeah. I mean, a surprising amount of thought has gone into yes. terraforming Mars. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there's some very specific calculations yeah. about sort of how much you have to do. And, and most of it involves lots of nuclear warheads and melting, mm -hmm. melting subsurface uh, water, uh, which is a better way to use nuclear weapons than a lot of the current ideas. So, so I, I think... Um, it's Korea, North Korea, a signatory to the... Uh, <laughs> uh, so so we're, we're much more likely to be living on Mars in the way that Beth was living in Antarctica rather than um, actually changing the planet so we could live there. And there's a lot of research as well looking at that as sort of in terms of life support systems. So down in Antarctica, we, had, we were sort of recycling all of our water and again sort of using hydroponic. Wait, when you say recycling your water, <laughs> do you mean you were drinking your own pee? Not at Concordia, and that's my top <laughs> tip for anybody going to Antarctica and using our water recycling is the fact that it doesn't recycle the urine. Okay. So anyone having a shower and peeing in the shower, it's sort of top tip, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, say, say Jen did go to Mars, what would happen to her poo and wee? It Sorry? would get recycled. It would get recycled. It would get recycled. We are looking at it now. We do it on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. The urine is cleaned and, and turned back into drinking water much like the water that comes out of our tap in some places, and we've miniaturized that and taken that technology out into developing areas, we would have to do the same thing on Mars. We'd have to do it on the way there and whilst living on the surface. We, we don't recycle poo on the space this station. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 we we might need to on Mars. Um, yeah. we're we looking our potatoes in it. We are yeah. looking at how <laughs> you would take a completely closed-loop life support system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We're looking at that, yeah. And actually, that is something, that, again, that they're looking at at Concordia. So they do have a, what we call black water recycling machine, which is exactly <laughs> that. <laughs> but thing. currently, it's not working at the moment. It's out of action. <laughs> but you're just <laughs> full of euphemisms, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but, I mean, it's incredibly hard, the recycling thing. And so, actually, although you'd like to have what they call closed loop life support, where you take everything and you recycle it over and over again, actually, you can sort of do that. You tend to need an entire planet and an atmosphere and an ecosystem. Every other attempt to do it has failed fairly miserably. So we talk about this thing called progressive loop closure. So basically recycling more and more and more. So you go to space and you become the ultimate environmentalist. Really. But hasn't London water supposedly gone through nine sets of kidneys? Something oh. like that, yeah. It, I think we're starting to descend. <laughs> I don't really want to be talking about I don't about. live in London. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, we have run out of time to put any more of your questions to our panel. Before we finish, do any of you have any suggestions for your first words on Mars? I'm going to put you all on the spot now. And while you think about that, I'm going to go through some of the um, audience ones. Um, so one of the Science Museum staff here tonight said that they would borrow Matt Damon's first words on Mars. In your face, Neil Armstrong. Um, yeah. 
then we've got uh, Captain Salmon on YouTube. I would say one further step for humankind, one step closer to unity and the stars. I mean, that's just a really nice version of what I try to do. Um, Jacob Beamer on Twitter says, that's one small step for humans and one giant step for all life as we know it. So basically all Neil Armstrong related. Any of you come up with anything? Well, I'm a bit clumsy, so I'd probably go, oh shit, I've tripped. Oh, <laughs> and oh. I apologize to anybody <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, who yeah. might be listening that might be underage. <laughs> Not underage, sorry. I'm, I'm just <laughs> digging a deeper I'd hole. say bother. Oh, bother, bother. I've oh, tripped. Bother. Wait, oh, bother, I've tripped. Uh, and moving swiftly on, uh, I've got a question for you. When do you think it is, when can you predict that we will actually move to Mars? Human, humans reaching Mars, making the, the first steps. The space agencies are planning on having humans in orbit around Mars in the 2030s. And that finally feels like it might be within reach. But that's going around that's the going planet, around Mars. Going We're then the talking about landing on Mars, and then you're talking about colonizing Mars. I'm one who can't predict the future. You can ask me about my knowledge of MP3 players, but I'm going to go for about 2050. 2050s. Before so we that, actually step foot. Step before foot. we, before we colon, we talk about okay. you know living on Moving. Mars. But I think we'll see humans on Mars before then. Before then, when? Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm not. You down. <laughs> Will Jen make it to Mars? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> not a nice way to end the show. <laughs> Monica? Well, I'd say 40 years, because it's always been 40 years. Like, nuclear fusion is 40 years away. Getting to Mars, it's 40 years away. It, in 10 years' time, it'll still be 40 years away. OK. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Monica's right, and, and that, that is the great line. It's not quite 40 years, but I would say Mars lies 20 years in our future, and it has done since the 1960s. Uh, I mean, and you can understand why they were so optimistic because in the 1960s they went from nowhere to the moon yeah, in, yeah. in about nine yeah, yeah, years yeah, yeah. and so they thought Mars was just around the corner yeah. and there are lots of very very mature mission designs for opportunities calculated opportunities in the 1980s um, when can we go we could go now we can go now um, if you've got enough money the technology exists it depends on how much risk you want to embrace. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't and, have the and, money. And the answer Proud is an awful funding lot of for risk. Jen at any point. Um, <laughs> uh, but really, it's a political, it's a political question. So it's when, when does any government or, or collection of governments decide they want to do it? Or it's a technology and economic question, which is when can you make it cheap enough for us to do without anyone really worrying about it too Thank much. you, Kevin. And really briefly, because we're running out of time now, Beth. Um, I just believe that it will happen within my lifetime. So I do truly believe that I will see human step foot on Mars. Yes, and I'm going to go with that. I'm still feeling um, pretty excited about this trip to Mars, almost as excited as one of our guests felt about landing a robot on a comet. I'm <laughs> sorry, Monica. Uh, you must be sick of the sight of this by now, but we felt we couldn't resist it. Um, let's have one final round of applause for all of our guests, Libby Jackson, Monica Grady, Kevin Fong, and Beth Eden. <laughs> now, don't go away, because the journey into space continues here on the live stream. Over the next 20 minutes or so, we're bringing you highlights from everything else that's been happening here at the Science Museum's late event. Coming up, some demonstrations of amazing scientific discoveries, experiments, and even a sprinkling of bed bugs. Wow. And later on, Dr. Hannah Fry will be answering your questions live on Facebook. So make sure that you're online for that. But first up, here's Dr. Ellie Cosgrove with an interview she filmed earlier on this evening here at the Science Museum with the people from Wellcome, who've been testing who could adapt to life on Mars. We know that sleep is really important for a healthy life on Earth, but what happens when we move to Mars? I'm here with Angus, who's going to explain a little bit more. So, the main thing which tells us when we want to sleep is our body clock, and everybody's got a slightly different length of body clock. Some people have a shorter body clock, which makes them an early type. Some people have a, later, a longer body clock, which makes them a late type. If they've got a late body clock, you're constantly trying to wake up early, and you're constantly usually a bit tired. And that has big effects for your health and for how well you think. And if you go to Mars, because it's got a slightly longer day, because the planet rotates slightly slower, you actually get an extra half an hour in bed because the day is a little bit longer. So that means you're going to have better sleep, you're going to have better health, and you're going to be able to think better. An extra half a day, an hour in bed sounds brilliant to me. And Leonie, you have a test that's going to check what kind of type of person we are. Yes, um, so 
we're using a questionnaire to find out your sleep and wake time preferences. So one question, for example, would be what time would you choose to go to bed if you were entirely free to plan? So for me, that's going to be around midnight, maybe later. And I've also answered all of your other questions. So can you reveal what type am I? Yes, I've analysed all your answers and you're definitely an evening type. So you would actually find it easy to adhere to the new schedule on Mars, which will be good for your sleep and good for your health. Nice one. Looks like I'm off to Mars then. I'm going to be joining Ellie. I better go do that to a quiz when we're done here. It's wonderful. Well, if we're going to live on another planet, then we've got to get there first. And the Science Museum learning team have been demonstrating very loudly uh, how space travel actually begins. Last year, we were all gripped with Tim Peake up at the International Space Station. But how did he get there? Well, I'm here with Nicolette, who has a very bubbly way of explaining it. So, in this bladder here, I have a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. And we're going to demonstrate how a powerful mix of hydrogen and oxygen can launch a rocket all the right. way up into space. All right, so we're going to fill some bubbles here with this mix. We're going to trap the fuel. So this is our rocket fuel going into the bubbles and this, storing it there. This is our rocket fuel. I think we've got enough bubbles now. Okay, what's next? Thank you. So to launch our rocket, we need to ignite it. All right, so this could get noisy. All right, so... Your ear defenders right on. Okay, we're gonna are we scoop safe? As many of these bubbles as possible out of this tray. We're going to light this candle over here. Okay, so this is rocket fuel close up on our plate in our bubbles. That is correct. Okay, so and we're going to go. see we what happens. We're going to stand right back, <laughs> okay. and we're going to light it together. Three, two, one, one. and then... Okay, that was a pretty loud bang, and it shows us how explosive rocket fuel can be when we see it really close up. Thank you, Nicolette. No worries. So I'm definitely going to need my earplugs when I go to Mars? I think you will. Cool. I think you will. Well, science developed in space and can have some truly amazing applications here on Earth, as we discussed earlier. And the Open University has been explaining why exploring a comet could, e could end up improving our holidays. So it's all getting very itchy down here at the Science Museum, but before we get onto bed bugs, I'd like to introduce Garen, who is exploring how to probe comets. Yeah, I was part of the Rosetta mission that landed on a comet in November of 2014. We spent 10 years and 4 billion miles chasing that comet to answer questions about life and uh, on whether the building blocks of life that are on Earth could have come from a comet early on in its history and whether water itself that's on Earth could have come from comets. Nice, and you used this machine to do that sniffing. That's right. We took something the size of a family car and we shrunk it down to the size of a shoebox. So this weighs about 4.5 kilograms and uses less power than the light bulb. But it actually allows us to measure the chemicals that make up the comet. Nice. But the applications, are there any earthbound applications of this kind of technology? Oh, well, there's plenty. And so uh, the fact we can make something so small and robust and portable means we have a number of applications on Earth, which includes measuring the air quality in submarines, uh, quality of perfumes, but also we can also look for cancer and even bed bugs. OK, so how does that work with the bed bugs? Well, bed bugs use chemicals to talk to each other. So instead of using sound, they release different amounts of chemical. We can then use that machine, like Ptolemy, to then go and sniff and find out if bed bugs are present in hotel rooms. So space technology in hotel rooms to find bed bugs. Ugh, it's all a bit itchy down here. I bet Monica never thought that that was going to be an application of her research when it first started on that mission. So from tiny bed bugs to a huge universal phenomenon that can help guide us to Mars and beyond. And as Ellie found out earlier tonight, the Royal Society's LIGO scientific collaboration has been exploring one of the biggest discoveries in recent times. It may not look like it, but what we're doing here is actually playing with space-time. Emma, can you explain what's actually going on here? Sure. So just over 100 years ago, Einstein predicted that gravitational waves exist, and they are ripples in the fabric of space-time that travel outwards at the speed of light, stretching and squeezing both space and time. So if nice. you pick up your black hole... OK, I've got my black hole. And we spin them round. OK. You right. can see we get these ripples that actually form in the space-time itself. 
Okay, so these ripples are actually gravitational waves that Einstein predicted. And a couple of years ago, we proved that theory. How did we do that, Peter? Uh, we, we use a network of gravitational wave detectors. So the real detectors are four kilometers long, so obviously we couldn't bring that here today. So we've got a scaled down version here. And essentially, they're L-shaped uh, detectors. We fire laser light down each of the arms. They, it recombines, and then because light is a wave, uh, we can then add up or subtract the wave. So if we filter out all the background motion, if a gravitational wave passes through, we can measure these really small uh, uh, variations in space, the stretching and bending of, st of space. So these machines are going to enable us to use gravity to map the entirety of the universe. Pretty nifty. Thank you very much. Uh, kind of a small, small deal there. Map the entirety of the universe. Pretty nifty. <laughs> Pretty nifty, as Ellie Cosgrove there said. Well, that was some highlights from this evening at the Science Museum late. Now from bed bugs to space bugs, next we have an extract from a panel discussion filmed earlier tonight about superbugs in space, led by Dr. Hannah Fry. And this is cool. So if you're watching the live stream, Hannah will be logged onto the Facebook to answering any questions that you might have. Welcome to the Science Museum's Lakes in partnership with Tomorrow's World and tonight we are talking all things space. Now earlier on this summer you may have seen a broadcast on BBC Two called Britain's Greatest Inventions which was broadcast from the Science Museum stores in Wharton and on that night after a huge public poll uh, antibiotics was voted as Britain's greatest invention. Now, also, later this year, there is a big exhibition here at the Science Museum on antibiotic resistance called Superbugs, the Fight for Our Lives. And tonight, we're going to combine bugs and space together and talk about mm -hmm. bugs in space. <laughs> space <laughs> bugs, exactly. <laughs> and I am joined tonight by two experts. We have uh, Professor Lewis Darnall here <laughs> from the University of Westminster and also uh, museum, oh, curator. You curated the Superbugs exhibition. That's right. Uh, this here is Sheldon Packerin. I hope I've said that yeah, uh, right. Great. What happens when you send people oh, up into space? Uh, with all of these bugs that, that, I mean, presumably are in and around the spacecraft as they launch? Um, so we know a few things about what happens to bacteria that go up with astronauts. Um, for example, we know that they, they divide, they multiply slightly faster than they would if they were on Earth. Um, we know that they mutate much quicker. Uh, so normally they would divide every 20 minutes or so. Um, under ideal conditions, which is incredibly quick to think of a generation. So you can imagine how quickly these things evolve. Um, they're also able to share DNA with one another um, naturally here on Earth, which is amazing to think that one bacteria could just sort of waddle up to another bacteria and just sort of say, <laughs> have some DNA, this worked great for me. Um, so that would be really fantastic. Uh, you know, maybe grow some wings or something because your buddy has some wings. Um, but uh, but in, in space, uh, they're, they're able to divide and mutate um, even more efficiently and even faster than they can here. Why is that? Um, so a lot of it is because of microgravity. Um, so uh, if, if you imagine a lot of bacteria here on Earth are stuck to surfaces, um, and in space they don't have that um, restriction. Uh, so they're able to take in nutrients, they're able to take in anything from their atmosphere in 360 kind of degrees. Uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're, they're able to take in things much easier and then divide much quicker. Um, so we know that they grow faster. And also something that we know about astronauts going into space is that one of the side effects, side effects, one of the effects of an astronaut being in space is that they become immunocompromised. So your immune uh, system naturally becomes not as strong. Um, so uh, initially, uh, in the first space miss missions, we would have astronauts coming back and they would be put in quarantine for fear of moon bugs. Um, but now the thinking is that they need to be back in quarantine to protect them because one of the first things that happens when astronauts get back is they get an infection and they're bedridden for a week <laughs> or two. Um, so it's the earth bugs they have to worry about. Exactly, yeah. Um, because they're immunocompromised and it completely uh, wrecks their system. So yeah, we, got, we have a really good idea about what happens to astronauts in space um, when they're exposed to this kind of thing and it's not pretty. The idea then of bugs being antibiotic uh, resistant, is that something that's more at risk you know, for the astronauts that are in space, catching something like that? Um, yeah, uh, if, if they catch an infection that's resistant to antibiotics, there's, 
there is nowhere for them to go that can help them out. If they're on Earth and they have an antibiotic-resistant infection, very often they'll be put into an isolation ward. Um, so they might be kept completely separate so that they can be kept in a, in, a, in a really contained space. But if you're in the ISS, while it is a closed system, you're still surrounded by all the microbes of yourself, of your fellow astronauts, and these also build up. Like We know, for example, that um, during deep cleans on Mir, they would remove a bulkhead and behind it would be a, a big globule of water that would just be full of microbes that were living quite happily as an ecosystem. So we know that these aren't actually sterile environments. Um, and as another example, um, on Mir, there was a cosmonaut that got a, uh, he got a, an infected tooth um, and there was just no way to treat it. So he had to live with his infected tooth for <laughs> four months. Tyson string and slammed, I think. Those That's it, yeah. <laughs> uh, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he lived with a severe toothache for four months and he said that he was losing the will to live in a very non-funny kind of way. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so it, that's the kind of future of medicine in space that we're looking at. Um, even more worrisome is that um, the anti antibiotics that we do have are very susceptible to cosmic radiation. Um, so they degrade very quickly. So if we're going to have a long-term mission, say, to Mars, which would be probably a two-and-a-half-year mission, um, if your antibiotics stop working three to four weeks, into that mission, you're up there without a medicine chest. Get all infections done early would be your advice for. Get there you go. Way. Yeah, yeah. Get out of the way. Get rid of all your teeth. <laughs> um, yeah. Just yeah. as a precautionary measure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't want to risk it. <laughs> okay, so um, Lewis, there. We know that these, these these spacecraft have lots of bacteria, lots of bugs on them. We know that they're mutating extremely quickly, um, you know, and, and reproducing very quickly in space. Does that matter when it comes to designing space missions? Yes, yeah, so, so one of the things that we have to be really careful about, if we're as astrobiologists and explorers going to Mars with our robots and looking for Martian life, we want to be really, really careful that life we find there is in fact Martian life and not our own contamination. We don't have kind of front page news across the entire world, we found Martian life. And then a fortnight later, have the embarrassing attraction of it was from his tooth. It was just Jeff. <laughs> he hadn't washed his hands again. We should have slapped him after that surveyor probe went to them. So, so it's all about planetary protection. It's called. How can we make sure we don't contaminate Mars or other places in the solar system that, that might host life with stuff from Earth that we think could be able to survive there? And this is the reason that um, in the next couple of days, the Cassini space probe that's been orbiting Saturn is going to be is going to go on a death plunge. We, we, we've aimed it at the planet. And it's going to burn up as this artificial shooting star in the upper, upper atmosphere and upper clouds of Saturn because we want there to be no chance that it crash lands onto Enceladus, which is one of the icy moons of Saturn, which I think has got a, an ocean under the surface that could, could harbour life. So we want to make sure we don't spread our terrestrial muck to places like that and then contaminate them so we then won't be able to find the, the native life later. Let's Maybe finish on a, on a slight more positive note then, if yeah. we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you make us feel a little bit better? about uh, the impending doom of uh, antibiotic resistance that's, heading, <laughs> that's just around the corner? Um, well, for starters, it doesn't take a whole lot to tackle antibiotic resistance. Um, so one estimate uh, in a, uh, a report released a couple years ago uh, within the government said that it would take about 40 billion pounds to tackle antibiotic resistance over the course of the next 20 years. So this isn't a huge global investment. Um, so we're, we're potentially there. We, we, we could do this. It's, it's, not, it's not super scary. Um, as well, uh, at the moment, um, we're not, this isn't something that's afflicting everyone. Um, we still do have functioning antibiotics. Um, it's not that antibiotics suddenly have disappeared. We have a lot of different kinds of antibiotics. So just because your infection is resistant to one kind of antibiotic, we could still potentially use others. Um, in the United States, they have 26 approved for human use. Um, so they can try others. Um, it's when they're resistant to everything that we really need to, to be concerned. And that does, it does happen, and it does happen in London especially. Um, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, we, we don't have chaos. We're, we're, we're doing okay. You are surprisingly smiley. <laughs> <laughs> Just sits around thinking about the end of the world. The <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you very much, Lewis and thank Sheldon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, now, don't forget that actually Sheldon's exhibition, Superbugs, will be uh, on display here at the Science Museum. Um, Superbugs, the fight for our lives, and it's the 9th of November. Got written here, does that sound right? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, and it's going to be in the Tomorrow's World Gallery here at the Science Museum. Thank you very much, both, and good Peace. night. 
Thanks to Dr Hannah Fry. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. So goodbye from the BBC Tomorrow's World live team. We are going to be back on the 23rd of October and we're going to be visiting the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. We're going to be discussing robots. That's goodbye from me, Dr Hannah Critchlow. And me, Dr Jen Gupta. Good night and happy space travels. Cool. Okay. I, think, I think as they say it, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you so much to all of you.